Hi, this is Madison with Ray Outfitted, and we're here today to do a walkthrough of the plumbing system that's inside this 2020 ProMaster. This ProMaster, we're doing a detailed series breaking down all of the aspects of it. Our hope is that these videos will help DIYers and van owners know what to look for, what to think about, and what to see beyond pretty photos on the internet. Repairability and accessibility are critical. This plumbing system started leaking, it was built in place without access, so it wasn't very obvious to the owners that it was leaking until it became a bigger problem. The only way we're gonna be able to fix this is to disassemble the bed. To assess the water system damage, uh, we had to remove the one panel from the side of the tank here to be able to remove it. Uh, so once we actually got the tank loose enough to get it out, uh, we found that the water leak was mainly coming from this lower bung down here. So because this is at the bottom of the tank, it was constantly leaking whenever there was water in the tank. Uh, and we're not sure if it was from the tank being able to move around or whether um, this was done during install. But the bung up here you can see is cracked. And so they would have had a water leak if the tank was also too full or accelerating. Now that we have the tank out, we have to now assess how far this damage goes to see what we need to repair to go further forward. The water damage comes all the way across the back of this cabinet and then also over to our electrical cabinet. And the two blocks that are supporting the inverter uh, that were there when we got this vehicle. Uh, there's damage, water damage shown on the bottom of that one. So this electrical cabinet, we need to fully pull out, see what's underneath there. Uh, we can see it goes under the toilet and it definitely goes up under the front floor. So from here, we know we have to pull the kitchen and we will probably have to pull the um, driver's side cabinet as well and see how far that water damage actually goes. We can see that we have water damage under the hot water tank. So we wanna be able to pull this out to see what is actually happening underneath there. Uh, to do that, this cabinet has been built too small and we can't get the hot water tank out the front or out the side. So this panel has to come off so we can see what is happening inside there. And we can see inside here, uh, the plug that the water tank is plugged into is a standard household outlet. It is not a ground fault interrupt circuit. Uh, so with that, if there was any ever any short or water spraying on that, that can be a massive problem. So if you're ever putting an electrical plug that close to water, make sure it is rated correctly for that usage. So again, if you ever had to do any servicing here, uh, I don't know how you would have got the water pump out of this without having to either uh, break this front panel off or take the whole thing out and try to disassemble it outside of the vehicle. And to do that, again, bed would have had to come out and we don't know what this is connected to up front. We haven't got that far forward. Now that we actually have access in here, we can see how the water pump has been connected. Uh, we can see it is, yes, it is Romex wiring, uh, but it has um, morettes attached to it. Uh, morettes are not standard for vehicles. They are not standard for boats. Um, some RV manufacturers will use them. If they do use them, they electrical tape them on so that they can't back off. Because the problem is that vibration can easily cause that like i barely even turned that like that was an eighth of a turn and that one again eighth of a turn you now don't have a water pump what some manufacturers are switching to are what are called lever nuts so here's a lever nut here uh, we've installed and i can put i have to put a lot of force on that to actually get to slide off on the stranded wire it really doesn't want to come off and they're nice and serviceable and don't damage the wires so that is another option other than using butt connectors on everything. So we're going to be removing the drawer system out of the center here now. Uh, the drawers uh, are bottom mount slide. So there's releases on the bottom that help get the drawer out. Uh, we've already got the one out and we can't get the bottom one out. So it is going to have to stay in while we take this whole assembly out. Now 
now that we have this cabinet out, we can see the uh, bottom slides are actually starting to rust. Uh, and all the edge banding that they have put on this has all come off. Um, and then the top table that they put in uh, doesn't have any lock. And I know what the customer complained about when they hit the brakes really hard is this always flew out on them. So uh, every drawer uh, door that you're putting in, make sure there's locks or something to hold it closed because this can be a projectile in a collision. Now we're getting ready to finally remove this piece. Uh, there's a couple screws into the wall, a couple into the bottom. Uh, this is what was holding the water tank in place. Uh, not a single screw in it. Easy. Now that we've removed the um, garage area to see where the water damage is, we can see that the water damage does proceed into the front of the van. So with the laminate flooring being underneath the front cabinets, to be able to address the potential water damage under there, we're gonna to have to remove those cabinets as well. One L bracket, two screws on this side, and then five screws holding this one to there. They had vertical studs, should have run screws through to hold it in there. Uh, that would have secured this a lot better. Well, taking the sink side out here, uh, we can see here's the heater here. Uh, I can see two large faults from this right away. Uh, actually, three. Uh, the first fault is that it's not actually bolted to the ground, so which means it's definitely not sealed to the floor. There is the possibility for exhaust gases from the vehicle to come up through or exhaust gases from the heater. Uh, another, uh, this is supposed to seal into here. Uh, so without that, it's not actually getting the proper airflow through the heater. And also the compartment it was in only had one probably inch, inch and a quarter hole as an intake for a 60 millimeter output, uh, which is roughly about two and an eighth inch. So uh, the heater didn't have enough airflow coming in that it actually needed. Uh, so that was another issue with this one. Got a composting toilet of some kind in here. Uh, kind of looks like a DIY version of one. We've got a good refrigerator and a good induction stove that we want to save while taking this apart. So that's going to be what we have to try and maintain while getting this panel out. So the first thing we're going to do is remove the uh, backsplash for the seat and then we're going to remove the fridge and see if we have access to remove the cooktop. Warmerettes here. And those didn't even have to twist. These cooktops suck air in through the bottom and then dump air out the side. So if you're trying to boil a pot of corn or something, I'm pretty sure this stove would shut off on you from overheat protection. There it is. That. I keep picking the damage. Water damage in this wallboard. So this lower wallboard has to come out, which means the entire subfloor has water damage. There's your toilet. It's your pee jug, and that's your poop bucket. Wait, what side? This is, is so the oh, pee jug, oh. the pee, like it doesn't even actually, really, you gotta like, hmm. it's some, make it fit. So now we're going to remove the floor. Uh, we've removed the trim panel, uh, and, but it's brad nailed down. So we've got to work at getting this up. There we go. And you can see there's still water under the floor. So this ha never had a chance to fully dry out. Uh, this hasn't had any water in the system for, I think, three months now. Now that we have the floor out, we can actually see the whole subfloor. Now the water tank was here, leaking, coming up. And as we can see and mentioned while pulling up the floor, it's still wet here. Uh, the subfloor is all still wet over here too. And from that, with it all being trapped there, it had nowhere to go. And it started wicking towards the back of the vehicle. Uh, this is where the inverter was, the bike slide. But where the drawer system was, the floor is dry because it actually was able to allow it to evaporate out from the floor. 
it did get all the way into this corner and there must have been water sitting in the bottom because it's starting to wick up this wall board too. So that means that there was a lot of water even just sitting in the floor on this side. So once we actually get the subfloor up, we'll be able to see what's underneath. Uh, this is looks like a bigger job than what we had originally anticipated. We knew some of the subfloor was going to be rotten. We didn't think it was going to be this bad all the way up to the front. So taking the van down to the stage it's in um, was quite the experience, to be honest. Um, we had known there was electrical issues and we had an accessibility problem to address it. And that was on this side of the van. On the other side of the van, we saw hints of water damage and the water system was also not made to be accessible. What really surprised us was how far back we need to take the upfit to even access the basics of this. Unfortunately, what it revealed is what truthfully was our worst case scenario of, of what we had predicted for the owners. And that is that the leak was so significant and so prolonged that the entire floor would be soaked through. Even the items that are in now, we can't trust that it took barehanded effort um, to remove most of the cabinetry. We now have to distrust everything else that's still installed that if there was a side collision, if anything happened to this vehicle, that any of this is at uh, a greater risk of damage. And for us, it's a risk we wouldn't take for our own selves, and we certainly would never take it for a client. I think whether you're a DIYer or you're hiring a professional, when you think of your van, you want to think of it as a modular thing. Anything you put into it, it needs to have a way to come out. So how everything gets installed and how it can come back out. For us, we find it's best that we document every stage of the upfit and that we leave those photos with our clients. That means they have that knowledge if, if they do have to take things out, how it went in makes it that much easier to take it back out. And if everything you put in your vehicle, you consider the ways it can break, the ways it can fail, the ways it needs maintenance, how you might want to upgrade it. If you bury your electrical, you're not adding another light switch or another light. If you bury your plumbing in households, in standard RVs, plumbing leaks. If we bury it, we can't fix it. And the consequences of, of that short-sightedness is, is inconvenience, disappointment. And you might have been excited for your first trip, but this van didn't make it through the first trip. Based on everything we've seen and everything we've needed to remove to date, we're going to be proceeding with removing the entire upfit from the vehicle. Good cabinet hardware. The shocks are maybe a little tall for these doors because it hits the roof, but other than that, this looks pretty good. Let's see just how well attached these cabinets are. So far we've done nothing to actually damage their ability to hold to the wall. If anything, we've given them a little easier chance by taking the weight off the front by taking the doors out. So we'll just see how much holds them here. They actually feel pretty good, which is a good thing because there's one thing that broke loose that's a certainty to kill you in an accident. It's your upper cabinets. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Ah, that's a shame. Well, that's not great news. I wouldn't want to be in this if we got an accident. So right now we're looking for what was actually attaching this to the ceiling. Um, there's a couple screws up. Nothing. It looks, like. looks like there was a nail. Oh no, that's a screw that snapped there. So there was one screw. A couple little thin strips of wood across the back. Two screws held in with there's little number six screws. One of them. And a couple of nails. Yeah, so the, these are built. Uh, these were built like standard household kitchen cabinets. Uh, and they were held in basically like standard household cabinets. There was very little actually securing it to the vehicle. There was three vertical screws, a uh, number of horizontal screws, and you can see like this board is still attached here, but it only had one screw. Uh, this one 
has three holes on it, but I bet once we pull these off, there's only actually one. No. Well, there are three screws there, but two Ooh. of them are doing more than nothing. Oh, well, there was even there's even a hole up here. Really, what but, to the cabinet was but yes, not very much. Those two had snapped, so I don't know if that was before or after. And back here, these screws were so close to the side that the wood just broke. Not enough. So this is another van that I'm building where we're partway through and I've got a little bit of my upper cabinets in. Um, the screws that hold this up are well hidden, but um, there's probably about half a dozen of them that go right into the metal body and the top rib in the sprinter. And then there's probably another half dozen screws that tag the ribs going across the roof in the body. So I'm quite confident these cabinets won't go anywhere. I can get the wood to creak on its screws a little, but other than that, nothing moves. In fact, the whole van will shake, but the cabinets move with it. Glue? That's harder to get out than the cabinet was. Well, maybe. such a shame that uh, cabinets weren't actually attached to these. Just a couple screws in the metal body and it's not going anywhere. Close but not quite. Yeah, so close but not quite there. This piece bothered me from the very first time I saw it. It seems a great way to get killed by a single hardback novel. Can't trust that to hold anything in those shelves, so it's decorative. I don't think there's a whole lot holding this ceiling up. I think that might be dangerous. And this is why, like, the pretty of not having screws in your ceiling makes no sense. no sense. The screws can look good and, oh my god, maybe save... Save a life? Maybe save a life. Watching the ceiling come crashing down, I think, really hit a, a chord with me. This van and this project has been in a very emotionally charged journey for us. When we first met this van and its owners, we were just here to do small adjustments, small upgrades, and it was a really tough choice for us to sit them down at one of their pickups. We truly felt like we crushed their dreams and their, their hopes for their retirement travels by walking them through what issues we saw with the van and it felt like the wrong and right thing to do. The right thing to do can feel really terrible. And it felt really terrible to bring this couple to tears, describing that what they thought they had bought well and been intelligent doing was, was going to be such a painful thing. That cedar ceiling is, I think, quintessential Instagram, Pinterest van life. Everyone has that cedar ceiling Everyone likes to brad nail it in because that lets it look clean. You don't want to see a screw head. We've certainly had disagreements with some of our own clients who want that ceiling and we refuse to do it. We refuse because we fear this. Seeing that ceiling come crashing down, I, I walked away thinking about the laundry list of ways this van could have this upfit, I should say, the van isn't the issue. Walking away, this upfit could have killed its occupants in 
in so many ways. Is it the ceiling coming crashing down in a rollover accident? Is it a side punch to the, the upper cabinet, smashing the cabinet into you? Is it carbon monoxide from an incorrectly installed heater? Is it the electrical shortages causing an issue? Is it the electrical outlet right underneath a water leak causing an issue? I, I can't keep track of how many things were done without thought of, of safety, of functionality, of, of the realities of a vehicle. And I think while it scares me to think this van could have stayed on the road, that its owners could have had something go wrong, I think what scares me the most is to know there are countless others on the road who do and perhaps do not know the risks of what they've built, of what they're driving around in. We hope these videos continue to give you insights that help you in your own projects. In the next video, we will be taking out the floor and subfloor to continue to understand the state of damages done and to be able to get this vehicle ready for its next life.